Welcome to the Find Your Voice, Change Your Life podcast with psychologist Dr. Doreen Downing. Listen in as Doreen interviews people who felt they didn't have a voice or who suffered extreme speaking anxiety. You'll hear stories about how they struggled to speak up, what they did to find their authentic voice, and the confidence they now feel to speak up and make an impact. If you want to get started right away to find your voice, download Doreen's free seven step guide to fearless speaking at Doreen7steps.com. And now, here is Doreen. Hi, this is Dr. Doreen Downing, and I am so happy today to introduce you to somebody that I met a few months ago in San Francisco showing up at his talk. And it was about a new book he had written on illustrated black history. So he's not only an artist, he's a cultural icon, I might say. Hi, George. Hi, Dr. Doreen. How are you? (laughs) I'm really happy that I get to open up the space and have a conversation with you today. You sent me a bio, so I'm going to read it the best I can. Mm -hmm. George McCalman is an artist and creative director based in San Francisco, and his design studio, McCalman, Kalman Co. collaborates with a wide range of cultural clients. He's a columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. His observed and first person columns document Bay Area culture. And his first book, the one that I just mentioned, illustrated black history, honoring the iconic and unseen was published in September, 2022. And um, George, I, that's, hey folks, that's where I first found George is the day I showed up to hear his talk because I think it's so important. I, for those of you who don't see me (laughs) and are just listening, I'm white and George is black. And I, I just felt like this was an opportunity for me to get more educated, a whole group of uh, not only who he is as an artist, but who he's who he's drawing, who he's illustrating in this book and telling stories about that. So that was my reason for inviting him to come because it's all about voices, his voice, as well as the voice he's channeled of all these amazing, as he says, the iconic and the unseen in black America, but it's our America. We're all here together. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, so let's, uh, I'll dial back to that day. I stood in line for an hour to get you to sign my book. And somewhere along the line, after meeting you and listening to the talk, I felt like I've got to introduce him to my audience. He knows something about what it's like to have struggled to have a voice, his own voice in this life, (laughs) your life as well as going on to illustrating other people's lives. So first, that day, let's just go back to that day because you mentioned what Mm -hmm. that was like for you. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I mean, the the day was um, on the surface, one of many events. Uh, I've been on a book tour and I still am on technically on a book tour. I'm actually leaving for Washington, D.C. Um, tomorrow night to speak at the Martin Luther King Library um, in uh, in the center of D.C. tomorrow with Emil Wilbekin. Um, and so these events that I have been a part of, it's, it's not a very typical book tour in that way um, because this book is very uh, not typical, it's very atypical. Um, I am the co-writer, artist, and designer of the book. So what that means is that I have a lot of different ways of talking about this experience and that it has given me, um, it has given me another way to let the audience in, um, that it's not really just about me. It's not just about my process. It's not just about my, my voice. It is basically about um, re-educating Americans on the people that they should be paying attention to that have defined and redefined uh, what American culture and history actually is. Actually is, yes, uh, with an exclamation point. That's true. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that uh, taking the time that you did to find who those people are to you. I mean, I, if I sat down and did it myself, I'd probably pick different people, you know, and that's, and that's, and that's the point. Yes. Yes. That's, yes. That is the point. It's this book is not a definitive guide. It's not meant to be, it is meant to be an accessible guide to the people that most Americans don't know. And, and the beautiful thing about information is that we always keep learning and, and, American narrative tends to define things in best and, you know, worst and favorites. And that's really not what it's about. And that's not what it's, that's not what this experience was for me. I wasn't trying to create um, an all access guide. What I was trying to do was, was create a personal guide yes. that, um, that others could find their way into that I made a book deliberately accessible so that no one could feel that I, I didn't want to listen to any excuses from anyone about their awkwardness around this subject. I wanted it to be accessible to let everyone know that this is, no matter what your ethnic origin is, if you are an American, this is your history too. Oh, thank you for saying that out loud today so that it can resonate across <laughs> our our airways. So uh, you, however, grew up in America. So if we wrote a book about you and you were illustrated in here, what might that uh, look like? What would that might, uh, what would the author might say about that, about your life? Oh, I, I mean, that just by virtue of the question, I don't think I can answer that question because that's for someone else to to write about. All right. Then let me ask it this way. George, where did you grow up? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was originally born in the Caribbean in a country uh, called Grenada. And I spent the first... Uh, eight, nine years of my life there. And my mother and I moved to Brooklyn in 1980. And I grew up, I, I grew up in New York. And so I, all of my formal education was there. I learned a lot of things that have served me as a human being. Um, living in that vast megalopolis um and I moved out to the Bay Area 23 years ago and I've been here ever since. I will ask you just a few more questions because I'm a psychologist. And I always love those stories about early history. So you moved here with your mom only, it sounds like, not uh, a father. Um, yeah, my, my parents uh, divorced uh, at age six. And so my mother and I, a few years later, uh, moved to New York together. Yes. And why New York? Well, we, at the time, um, we had a lot of family there and, and, you know, there are places that you will find Caribbean enclaves in the United States and New York is one of the largest ones. You know, there are some cities in Florida that attract in Canada, it's Toronto in Europe, it's, it's London, it's the UK. Um, my mother was looking for community. She, um, and she was looking for a place to me, for me to, you know, kind of see the world. Uh, my mother is a very avid mm -hmm. and curious traveler. And so for her, she wanted me to be in a place where I would embrace life. Yes, exposed to life, uh, mm -hmm. circulating, stimulating all around you. I was not in the country. Of course, those could also be stimulating, but George, one last question about early history and relationship, because that entrance into our educational system, sometimes for a young boy, you know, you weren't born here, but uh, what was that like to go through this early education system? And did you feel like you had a voice yourself? Did you feel like you were, you belonged? Were you, a lot of times young kids are teased or bullied? Any memory? Well, you you said earlier you used the word struggle, and I don't know that I would attach that to myself. Um, I I've always been I've always kind of had a reporter's brain. I've always been a kid that has that was quiet, 
and very sensitive and very much uh, paying attention to my surroundings. And I was always a very kind of psychological, um, I always had a kind of psychology and a philosophy to how I think and how I think about the people and how I think about the world around me. And so I am someone that spends a lot of time in my brain. And so I, and I'm also an only child and I'm, I'm an only child in a very large family. And so I was a kid who knew how to keep myself occupied. I am not someone who's easily bored because I come from a family that is very much we're doers and we know how to occupy ourselves. And my family is still very much like that. You know, there will be five of us in a room together and we're sitting silently and comfortably in each other's company. And one person is crocheting and one person is writing and one person is, and my family is very much still like that. I, I, whenever I visit my grandmother in the Caribbean, I'll sit, she's crocheting, she's doing word puzzles, I'm reading. We'll stop occasionally. She'll read me a passage from what she is writing. It's a very communal. It's not, we're not isolated and it's not cold at all. It's very warm and communal. But we are all people who know how to find our agency. And, and learning that at a, as a young age sought me, found me well when I lived in New York, because New York is a very isolating place and it still is. Mm -hmm. But I kind of found my rhythm in terms of how to keep myself uh, occupied growing up. Yeah, I get the image, that's wonderful. And what you talk about in terms of the articulation and being able to kind of live and think in a world and observe and reflect, I know that that was one of the things I loved about listening being in your listening audience is being captivated about the uh, the way that you see life, the way you see the world. And uh, when did you begin to do art? If that was a time, or does it always was it always just natural for you? Always, it's it's always been yeah. there. Yeah. Um. I I only started describing myself as an artist um seven years ago. Oh wow. So. <laughs> but I have been a creative, I've been an artist my whole life. Um, you know, I can look back and see the breadcrumbs really plainly. I would say I'm an artist because of two people. Um, my mother, who would not describe herself as an artist, and my grandmother, who is the person I developed uh, my storytelling skills from. She is, uh, she's turning 100 next month. <laughs> And is is uh, still one of the best storytellers I know, and I've I've said this countless times. But my grandmother is responsible for me being the person that I am, um, even more than my parents. Uh, and my mother, my mother passed away two years ago, and she she would say, she would agree with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my grandmother has has had a very profound impact on my on my life, and. Um, but I think that the origin of me was my mother as a young kid, me asking her to draw things mm -hmm. and watching as she made images out of nothing, out of thin air. Oh. And I remember just being captivated by that, mm -hmm. that it just, it didn't, the stimulation, it just, my senses were just alive. And I always remember just being dazzled by someone being able to create mm -hmm. and and I've always had an admiration even all in the years where I did not think that I was part of that tribe I have always gravitated to I have encouraged I have mentored I have learned from artists and that's always been my center of gravity and when I decided a few years ago that I was going to turn my attention to it. I was surprised at what rushed in. It was basically the previous 40 something years of not thinking I was an artist. It just filled in. It was just like an empty cavern that a whole bunch of rain and water just came in. And suddenly I looked and there was a lake. Yeah, you talked about something in uh, something that happened in in Mexico, Mexico City. Mm -hmm, Is that the time mm -hmm. period you're 
mentioning. Yeah, it is. Yes, um, the event that um, that you came to was the premiere of a fifteen minute documentary um, that was created on the making of illustrated Black history and. Um, and in that documentary, Mexico City is a character and a player in that story in that I went to visit for the first time and I was, my cells were rearranged from the experience because I saw a physical manifestation of what I had been. That is something I actually had been struggling with was figuring out how I could be an artist when I had been an art director for most of my career. You know, it's, I was trying to figure out the engineering and the mechanics of that. And I was, I was, I was having my, you know, one of my first real existential quandaries and just kind of like, how, how is this going to work exactly? How is this going to work? Um, and I tend to think very pragmatically about things. I let myself dream wildly but then there's the other side of my brain that's that's like, how are we going to do this exactly? And when I was there, I remember looking around and seeing and feeling that the city was answering me directly. And it was telling me that I could put two tastes together that I did not think would be in the same bowl and that I could merge those two practices, those two disciplines, that it was, um, that I didn't, it didn't have to be one or the other, it could have been both. And so I, that I ended up doing that. I took a sabbatical and I devoted a year basically to just making art and not figuring out what I was gonna do with it. I just basically just jumped. And then at the end of the year, I thought I would want to give up design and being a designer. And it became clear to me that I needed to do both. And so I've been doing, I was, I've been doing all of the above since. Yes, I know you talked about the studio and it was in the documentary in San Francisco and mm -hmm. how important that was as a place. And then you also talked as we go into the book itself, you know, that, that moment of beginning to just start illustrating uh, yeah. people. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that movement into being um, more self-identified as not only an artist, but then beginning to be drawn to what you wanted to illustrate. Yes. How did that, what was that moment? Well, it's, it is all um, gradual. You know, there are no sudden moves in my life. There are sudden circumstances. There's the stuff that's uh, outside of me that I have no control of. And then there, there is my internal calibration, which, which I pay a lot of attention to. And so when the internal force meets the external force, there's ch change and transformation. And I have always been clear about that. And, and I'm pretty grounded about that. So even when I'm faced with new obstacles, I trust my ability to kind of dial into my internal values, my core, my center. And, and even that has been a process. I'm, I'm speaking very plainly about it now, but it was a lot of fits and starts and trying to figure out basically how to solve these kinds of challenges. And to do so in a way that was fair to me, myself, and fair to the people that I work with and my clients. And I had a lot of considerations that if I thought too hard about them, I probably probably wouldn't have done this. You know, there, there are lots of reasons that we as human beings keep ourselves away from our dreams. Yeah. Uh, and for me, it was is this going to be disruptive to the professional life that I've already set in motion? Mm -hmm. And and in being kind to myself, in searching for an answers, I found that I really had to slow everything down and take things one day at a time, that I was really intentional and declarative 
in wanting to investigate this. And for me, it was always about identity. This is, this is what merges my design life with my artistic life. Mm -hmm. And learning that design, the, the side of my brain that, that is an art director and a graphic designer and a brand strategist is one side of my, my reptile brain, which is very analytical and is an engineer and very much about systems and process. But then I have a creative brain that doesn't work that way at all. And that is a very different way of viewing things. It's about the mood that I'm in. It's about whether I, I'm in the headspace for it. It's the brain that says, I need to take a walk before I pick up a pencil. Uh, that, that is very opposite. And the two sides basically have just been speaking to each other for the last few years. And that's what I, I just want to come in is because as I'm listening to you and my work is about voice and I'm hearing you talk about these uh, sides that feel like they have voice. It's a voice that you're listening to mm -hmm. something and yes. um, being the one, not only one side or the other, but the one who is integrating. You talked about transformation. So yes. and how, do you, yes. how do you be all? How do you be all of it? <laughs> all mm -hmm. the voices. And it, you know, it it feels, and I think it's one of the things I, I find language fascinating because there's a shared language. You live in, in America and people speak mostly English, but then they also speak Spanish and they speak French and they speak Arabian and they speak a lot of other languages. And there are a few universal words that translate across the board, but then there is cultural language. But I pay particular attention attention to personal language. Mm. It's something I think that translates transcends language. It is the conversation we have with ourselves on a daily basis that no one else has access to. Yes. What are the stories that we are telling ourselves? And for me, what I wanted to do was really start listening to myself more, yeah. trusting my instincts more. And the main thing, and I think it's something Americans are plagued with and our society is plagued with, where people feel entitled to understand things immediately. And being from the Caribbean um, means that I have never subscribed to that. It's a different way culturally of viewing things. I don't feel an entitlement to understand everything I don't understand in the moment. I allow things to take their time. I'm not impatient. I'm very patient with uh, information. And I feel like it it always comes and you have to slow down to accept it. Some of it will show up inside of a conversation, inside of a few days of thinking about it. But some awarenesses won't show up for years. Some won't show up for months. And if you know that, you will be listening for it when it arrives. And so it's the currency and speed of that voice. Trusting my voice means that I don't always have the answers. And that if I don't have the answer, it doesn't mean the answer is not going to come. Yeah, trusting that it will come. I get it. I get that uh, mm -hmm. you are such a teacher, such a profound teacher, just in sharing your uh, way of being, your way of listening. Thank you so much. I, yeah, this... thank you. And 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 it's all of you you mentioned that and and I am actually a professor. Um I I teach uh design at uh, California College of the Arts and and being a professor and being a teacher yeah. means that I get to reflect my own lessons that I learn from teaching back to myself yeah. and that I see myself as a student also. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's that's beautiful. The way you just described it too is that uh, there's not an identity of I'm the teacher. It's uh, it's one full, and it's all in you too. I, yes. I know we're. I it feels like I want to do ten of these conversations with you, <laughs> but I really 
want to come to the book and the voices that you found yes. the book before we go go to have to get off here soon. But the book Absolutely. itself, Illustrated Black History, honoring the iconic and the unseen. There's a I just was going to say this book. Is, I just want to read in the cover. This book is an, a, a celebration of a vital 400 year or old historical legacy a reading pleasure and educational tool, as well as one man's extraordinary and ambitious artistic endeavor. Hey, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> that is me. <laughs> so just anything you want to talk about with the book or the voices that how you found the voices in uh, these beautiful mm -hmm. illustrations. Well, the book is unconventional in a lot of ways. And I don't mean that it is not a book that anyone can pick up, but it's unconventional in the way that it was put together. Um, there aren't too many books where one person does all of the components of it. You know, the, the process of making books is very um, parochial. There are a lot of processes. It's It's been done a certain way for a long time. And when I decided to do this book, I, I knew that it was going to be kind of coming up against the publishing way of doing thing, uh, things. And I come from a publishing background, which is why I know how to do this. But I have to say it was a very humbling experience because I basically had to relearn um, the process. Um, and I've done things before where I have written, illustrated, and designed. So even that was not a new thing for me. But in terms of bookmaking and publishing, like my publisher has never had, I, I ended up being a pioneer in this process because HarperCollins had never had a an author before who was also the artist and designer of the book. Mm -hmm. And so even in, in the title of your podcast, I had to basically find my voice again for the context of this process. Mm -hmm. And I really had to kind of define some new terms and parameters for how I wanted to work with this, um, with the people that I work with and how I wanted to work with my publisher and most importantly, how I wanted to work with myself. And it was a six year process. It was mostly grueling. It was a very, very, very difficult process um, for lots of really kind of tedious and corporate reasons. But what I never lost sight of, that I was not going to compromise one iota of what I was doing in terms of the quality, because I felt like the pioneers in this book demanded that I not back down in terms of how specifically I wanted to tell their stories and how I wanted it presented and how I wanted these portraits to be rendered. Wow, you're talking about listening to all these voices and feeling mm -hmm. the the support for you to keep on going and moving, but also, I wouldn't say the expectation, but the like you were, it's almost like you were chosen. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, in the making of this, several spiritual people told me this uh, in personal conversations and it's not it's something I was too deep in the experience to admit but it was something that I knew I knew going into this project that um that I was being guided and I was being called to it and that I was uniquely qualified to be doing this book in this way and that it that it was it was a calling and that I I was responding to it because I knew I was ready at a, at a period 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I wouldn't have been ready. It's not, it's, I'm, it's not a larger universal thing I'm speaking to. It's that my experience, the timing, the divinity of it, like it was the right time when it was the right time. Mm -hmm. Divinity and dedication. <laughs> and dedication, yes. Yeah, well, I... I honor you for having taken the journey and the challenge and to have done, done the work. And where do people go to find you or get the book? Uh, 
obviously Amazon, but is there some place like yes. a website? How do we how do we just listen to you more, find you, look you up, anything? Yes. Well, I'm a very plain spoken person. So I I, I say things that are often that are perceived as controversial, but I don't think they're controversial. Um I I I say to people, anyone asking me about the book, I say like, you can go to Amazon, but they're the corporate devil. So you don't have to go to Amazon <laughs> to get this book. It's found anywhere. It's in bookstores all over the country, everywhere. But the thing that I suggest is finding your local independent bookstore because they're the ones who need your support. This book is not alone. This book doesn't need your support alone. Yes. Um, the independent bookstore industry needs your support. And even if they don't have the book, they can order it, call it in. So it's just a Google search away to find your local independent bookstore, give them a call or go online order it from them and it will be great fabulous that's or, a, that's that's another way to find for the audience to find their voices oh yes yes <laughs> making those choices and acting on making the those <laughs> active adult choices every day of our lives yes oh dear well there's one more thing i think is that if you if people can find you, they'll know where you're showing up to speak because that is huge. It's, and we could usually buy a book from wherever you happen to be speaking and sign exactly. and stand in line and get you to illustrate like you did for my yes. niece and nephew, Tyler and Lila. You wrote- uh, I'm Tyler and Lila. Yes. And you wrote their names on the, in the inside the cover and it's, it's cherished by all of us. Plus you signed right. So thank you. And Wonderful. I just, uh, I always like to whew, take a breath and see what wants to be said as something closing for you that may want to be come through. Spoken. Um, yes, I do have something to share. Um, the book um, itself is a very special keepsake. Um, but the long form of this project is education. Um, and so much of Black culture is under attack right now. Um, it is really important for this information to be out in the world because it is part of what this country needs to heal itself. Um, and so not looking away from this information is a great place. To, to take it seriously that this is American history and that this is your history, whether you are black or not. Um, and the, the book itself is being turned into a traveling exhibition that is gonna to be touring the United States. And so it is, um, you know, the book is, a, is, a, is an objet, but the idea is that you will be able to walk into a room and be surrounded by all of our pioneers. And so the show is being worked on right now. It is going to premiere next year. Um, my website will have more information on that as it's as it's developing. It, it's very, it's a very thrilling and exciting thing. Oh, I'm thrilled. I'm ready and I will be watching. Thank you so much, George. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Doreen. Thank you for being with us today for this episode of Find Your Voice, Change Your Life. Each person during interviews shares what has helped them find their voice. You can learn from these guests and find your voice so you can be confident to speak up and speak out. And remember to download Doreen's free seven-step guide to fearless speaking at Doreen7steps.com. We hope you enjoyed the show and we'll return next time. Until then, goodbye for now.